Great to talk to you. It's been so long since we've heard anything from you. A whole six or seven months at this point, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been lazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I like this uh, this work ethic, and I think um, you know the idea of, of touring less and writing more. I, I guess not every band could do it. You might have to be to a certain level, but as a fan, like this is, I would take this all day long from all the bands I'm a fan of. You know, just just pump them out. Well, it yeah, it's definitely it's a function of not touring, but it's also a strange function of sobriety and attachment disorder. Attachment disorder. <laughs> attachment issues, meaning like. I'm not in a relationship, and I don't have a family, and I don't have children, and I'm sober, so as a result, I have a lot of free time. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, those, like, dozens and dozens of hours a week when you're hungover or whatever suddenly have all this time to fill in. Honestly, there are only so many shows on Netflix to watch. <laughs> well, we're all benefiting from it, so uh, I guess I thank you and whatever in the universe for that. Um, and this new record, Everything Was Beautiful, Nothing Hurts. I, I, I want to start with the first single, too, with... Um, with Motherless Child, which, you know, goes back and, and takes another spiritual, which you've done plenty in the past. And I sort of wondered, what, what attracts you to those spiritual? What brings those in? Because you always do it in such a great way. I think it's, at its most basic, it's just the sort of the longing and the pathos and just the emotional quality of those old songs. And there's such a simplicity to them. Because you know, I, I grew up studying classical music, and my first music teacher was also obsessed with jazz fusion. And so he tried to teach me to love and to play really complicated music. And try as I might, I just found myself routinely gravitating towards things that were a lot more sort of, in a way, rudimentary and direct and simple. And a lot of those old, you know, the spiritual songs and the gospel songs are just so, yeah, straightforward and emotional. When I'm working on music, I sort of employ the same criteria as when I'm listening to music. And first and foremost, that's how does the music affect me emotionally? You know, because my music is capable of doing many things, but I think at its strongest, it delivers really powerful emotion. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, whether I'm you know, incorporating old traditional things into my songs or writing things myself, there ultimately has to be that that criteria of determining how the music affects me when I listen to it. Now, with a song like this, uh, like A Motherless Child, you know, if you just go by the lyrics, I thought, and looked at it literally, this could be a follow-up to The Day, which you had written actually about, if I read right, uh, a moment with your mother years ago back in the hospital. Am I close at all? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, it's, it would be hard to write personal music and not, to some extent, have it be autobiographical. But I guess, you know, what I try to do, and what, I'm not going to say that, what I, that I do it well, but that it's trying to like, take the, the very specific and subjective and create something that also has a degree, like a universal quality. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I ever succeed at that but you think of a song like david bowie's heroes and i'm thinking of david because today is the day that he died two right. years ago but you think of heroes and on one hand it's this very specific love song between two people but it somehow creates something so generous and universal or even like the, the best leonard cohen songs you know where sometimes they're very anecdotal and specific but somehow universal at the same time so i guess whether directly or inadvertently that's what i'm trying to do as well I'll tell you, The Day is still one of the most beautiful and, and sad songs, beautifully sad songs that I think I've ever heard. And, and, and again, I think as a fan, when I went into this, that was one of those things like, you know. But there is that moment, like, yeah. you know, like that's, that's the separation from the person who made us, you know, and how could that not be effective, you know, to, to any artist in their songwriting? Yes, I mean, it's the separation, again, this sort of, the, this idea that, that that experience can exist in two different ways. Like there's the specific experience of perhaps, you know, me losing my mother, but then the emotion of that, the, you know, the, the sadness, the grief, the longing, but that, that could also apply to the human condition, to how, you know, how we relate towards the universe in which we're born. You know, this, this feeling of separation, this feeling of, you know, confusion and loneliness. I assume that most people spend a good portion of their life you know, confused, separated, and alone. More so these days than I feel like maybe a few years ago. 
Yeah, I mean, it does seem like this the world in which we live is sort of, uh, I was going to say it's going through an existential crisis, but I certainly know as a species, it seems like most of the people I know are going through some pretty serious existential crises, whether it's environmental, personal, political, what have you. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly never felt despair for something, for people that I've never met like I have in the last little bit. And, you know, in bringing it back to this record, you know, when, it, when I look at the song titles like, uh, you know, Welcome to Hard Times, The Wild Darkness, A Dark Cloud is Coming, you know, that's, that's, it's impossible to not wonder, are we talking about the bigger pictures and, and political and environment uh, that's happening? Is, is that the basis for, you know, thoughts and titles like that? Yes, um, very much so. You know, you can't separate the art from the context in which it's created. But what I'm, I guess I'm more interested in now these days is looking at things on an almost sort of personal, not me personal, but like on a more like human level, mm-hmm rather than political or rather than structural. Because the the fascinating thing about this apocalypse that we're suffering through is it's an apocalypse that we've created. You know, in the past, our ancestors, when they struggled and suffered, it was usually because of circumstances outside of their control, like famine and rotten teeth and hungry bears. But now everything we're struggling with, you know, it's circumstances and situations that we've created. And it really does beg this question, like, why as humans do we keep making such bad choices? Do we have, do you have any idea of the answer to that right now? So I don't know if it's an answer, but it's a glimpse, a little bit of a glimpse into it is I was watching a documentary, um, which is what middle-aged sober people like me do a lot of. And in the documentary, it was about a watering hole in Africa during a drought. And it's like every creature in this environment, from lions to hippos to zebras to, you know, alligators, they'd all converged on this watering hole. And in the middle of it were these tiny little monkeys. And the monkeys would run up, scoop a handful of water, and run back before they got eaten. And they were like, you know, at the very bottom of the food chain at this watering hole. And I had this thought, I was like, oh, those are our ancestors, you know, terrified monkeys drinking water filled with alligator and hippo poo for a split second, hoping that they're not going to get eaten. So I feel like even though we've evolved to an extent, we're still those scared little monkeys at the watering hole. Yeah. We just assume that we're about to get eaten, every threat is a mortal threat, and we're never going to have enough to eat or drink. Now, w- with all this in mind, a, a big curiosity here, I do want to pull it into a very specific, because while the art does look at the bigger picture and the personal picture, much like the rest of us, myself included, and, and judging from, you know, I, I follow you on, on the socials, that you know your day to day is still very much like most of our day to day of getting trapped up in the news cycles and everything and and there was that moment last year a very cryptic post that you put last February where you sort of outlined things that were probably going to happen and some of that has happened right yeah so years of touring um and spending time in DC and New York i've managed to make a few friends in the intelligence community and i guess it was about a year ago We were having dinner, and they were really concerned, partially based on this, not to go too much in the weeds, but like this Fusion GPS report on Trump essentially being run as a Russian agent. And these are some active and former CIA agents who were, they're truly concerned. They were like, they're like, this is the Manchurian candidate. Like he have a Russian agent as the president of the United States. And so they passed on some information to me and they said like, look, you have a big, you have more of a social media following than any of us do. Can you please post some of these things just in a way to sort of put it out there? And, you know, you look at Dianne Feinstein who released the testimony from when Fusion GPS went before the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, and she just released those notes yesterday. And yeah, it does seem like, to what extent there's collusion, I don't know. But where there's smoke, there's fire. And when you have so much evidence pointing to the fact that Trump, the Trump administration is really in bed with the Russians in a very pernicious way. And unfortunately, I just don't see 
people in Congress sort of holding the, the administration accountable. Yeah, you know, it's 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 really disturbing, and it's 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 going to get quite a lot darker. Like the depths of the Trump family and business, their involvement with organized crime, sponsors of terrorism, Russian oligarchs. Like it's really it's really dark. So. Yeah, well, that was. I, did, I, did, like, I guess we should all like fasten our seatbelts and hold on. Because you know, when I look back at those tweets, there's almost like a glimmer of a hope in, in, in those posts that you know something is going, you know, the hammer is going to come down and, and things would change. But it sounds like you know, nearly a year later, with what's happened and what hasn't happened, and what you do, what you do know and, and, and might not know, but you don't sound as hopeful that there is going to be that result. Well, I, I worked under this naive assumption that. Our elected officials in the Senate and the House um, would be interested in investigating possible collusion between the executive branch and a hostile foreign power. And the degree to which even people like John McCain and Chuck Grassley have sort of abdicated their responsibility, that's what makes me really pessimistic, is that they're, you know, they seem to be putting party loyalty ahead of country and decency and i'm that, that i find that to be really threatening yeah well <laughs> we're all feeling really threatened uh day by day by day i mean luckily you know i can and and this is probably i'm this is definitely i'm saying this of a place of privilege i know this uh, i'm i'm able to wake up day by day and and look right ahead of me and and enjoy my work and do my day and most of the time my life doesn't change but oh yeah yeah, yep. you know, and, and that, that, that's what keeps one me thing I'm also, And one thing I'm really grateful for is that our president is incompetent. Like, just imagine how much more dangerous he'd be if he was intelligent and had emotional impulse control. You know, like, so I'm really grateful that if we're going to have a tyrant, at least let him be stupid and incompetent. <laughs> and it just hopefully bide our time until... It- yeah. If the hammer doesn't come down, then the election comes around, which there's a lot of good names that look to be in the hat next time around. So we can only be hopeful uh, of that, at least. Yeah. At least, you know. Yeah. And like, for example, there was one really pernicious representative, Daryl Issa from California, and he just has announced he's resigning. So right. I think a lot of a lot of people on that, like, and I hate being partisan, but like, you know, a lot of, let's say, not terribly honorable politicians are reading the writing on the wall and are resigning rather than going through an election they know they can't win. But like, and then hopefully my friend and neighbor Adam Schiff, once assuming we win next to, you know, November 6, 2018, then Adam Schiff becomes the head of the House Judiciary. And that is when things start to get really serious. Yeah. And, and not to go too pie in the sky big here, but, you know, as far as the big office with the folks who, do you have a dream team? Do you have a, you know, early, early wish list? Uh, I mean, my my dream, which is never going to happen, is that Michelle Obama will run, or Elizabeth Warren. And I mean, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris. I mean, I I was raised by women, and I was raised by feminists, and I just really want to hopefully see a, a female president yeah. sooner rather than later. Well, there's more momentum now than there's ever been, so we can be very hopeful of that. Yeah. Um, the album's going to be out soon. Uh, sorry to ask you this question, but does that mean your mind is already rolling to the next one? Because I know that's sort of how it works with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I'm planning on doing at some point this year is releasing uh, an acoustic orchestral album, like going back and revisiting older songs and doing them orchestrally and with all acoustic instruments. So I'm sort of working on that right now. Yeah, I cannot wait to hear that. But, but you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, I'm really looking forward to the release of this one. Everything was beautiful. And nothing hurts. Uh, hopefully a line that we'll be able to say once again one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope. I, I, I couldn't agree more. All right. Uh, it was really great talking to you, Moby. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was really nice to talk to you again. Thanks. All right. Bye.